Hello, and thank you for joining the National Keratoconus Foundation and our doctors from the Southern California College of Optometry for our series for optometry students on keratoconus and specialty contact lenses. We've launched this series to celebrate National Keratoconus Day and expand the education of optometry students who have a special interest in managing keratoconus. The National Keratoconus Foundation was founded by families affected by keratoconus in 1986, and it's the oldest and largest organization dedicated solely to keratoconus. Since 2016, the foundation has been located in Irvine, California. The mission of the foundation is to provide information and advocacy for individuals with keratoconus by sending free educational materials, answering inquiries, and producing newsletters and webinars. The foundation also hosts roundtable discussions at professional meetings like the Academy of Optometry and ARVO for researchers, excuse me, researchers and clinicians. Students are always welcome to participate in these events. The National Keratoconus Foundation launched World Keratoconus Day five years ago, and it's now celebrated internationally by those who are affected by keratoconus. All students who view these lectures and sign up for the National Keratoconus Foundation newsletter in November will receive a gift from the National Keratoconus Foundation. I'm Erin Roof, Chief of the Cornea Contact Lens Services at SCCO, and I'll be your moderator for um, this lecture series. For this series, our SCCO doctors will discuss various topics related to keratoconus um, diagnosis, management, and contact lens fitting. For this lecture, you have the special treat of hearing from our current cornea and contact lens residents, Drs. Elizabeth and Valerie Lamb. Dr. Cho did her undergraduate work at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and is a 2020 graduate of the Illinois College of Optometry. Dr. Valerie Lamb did her undergraduate work at Wheaton College in Illinois and graduated in 2020 from SCCO. Despite um, all of the COVID changes we've had this year, our residents have been seeing patients full-time since they started the program in July. They primarily see patients with irregular corneas, keratoconus, and other corneal ectasias, but um, they also get to treat a wide variety of anterior segment disease and perform full scope optometric care. Um, I think it's safe to say that their patient encounters this year have really underlined how essential specialty contact lens care is for our patients with keratoconus. And I'm excited for them to talk to you about the foundational concepts um, of, of understanding keratoconus. So without further ado, I'll let Drs. Cho and Lam uh, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Roof, for that great introduction and welcome everyone to the part one keratoconus lecture. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Cho. And my name is Dr. Valerie Lam. So let's get started. Okay, so what is keratoconus? Keratoconus is a slowly progressive, non-inflammatory, bilateral, asymmetric, but asymmetric corneal condition characterized by paracentral thinning and bulging of the cornea into a cone-like shape. So let's break down this definition a, a little further. So it's a condition of corneal ectasia. This means that there's thinning of the cornea resulting in an outwards bulging in a cone shape. Typically, this cone is located inferior and temporal. It is a bilateral but asymmetric condition. So what I mean here is that it is in both eyes typically, but one eye is typically more severe than the other. Keratoconus produces irregular astigmatism. So uh, it doesn't follow the rule of regular astigmatism where the flat and steep meridians are 90 degrees away. And it has been classically defined as a non-inflammatory condition due to the absence of cellular infiltrates. But I put a question mark there because recent research has shown that there may be an inflammatory component due to the presence of inflammatory mediators, such as interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, matrix metalloproteinase 9. So keratoconus may actually have an inflammatory component to it. Before diving into the details further, it's important to quickly mention the prevalence of keratoconus. There are two studies I'd like to highlight here. The first study was based in Minnesota, and they enrolled patients from 1935 to 1982. In this older study, they found a prevalence rate of every one in 2,000 people. In the second study here, they extracted data from a large health database in the Netherlands. For a period of three years, 
resulting in a prevalence rate of 1 in 375 people. As you can see, there's a rather wide range between these two studies, and we can attribute this to the growing use, uh, growing use and advancement of corneal topography, which is a diagnostic tool for keratoconus. Therefore, there is increased awareness, followed by more reported cases as well. The true prevalence of keratoconus is therefore slightly difficult to pinpoint because there's a variance in the patient ethnicity and locations of these two studies, but we can estimate that it's within the two ranges of these findings. Once you encounter keratoconus or really any other ocular condition in your optometric journey, it's important to refer to evidence-based research. The Collaborative Longitudinal Evaluation of Keratoconus, also known as the CLEC study, is one of the classic research papers of our topic today. This was an observational study that followed more than 1,200 patients for eight years, making CLEC a landmark study in keratoconus research. The main goal of the study was to prospectively evaluate progression of keratoconus, focusing on corneal scarring, visual acuity, corneal curvature, as well as quality of life. It also highlights several risk factors among those diagnosed with this condition. Although the study did occur 15 years ago, enrolling patients back in 1995, due to the large patient enrollment and consistent follow-up, this made CLEC study to be mentioned in many papers and journals today, and we'll actually refer to CLEC a couple times in our presentation as well. So let's go over some typical patient demographics. In terms of age, keratoconus typically onsets in teens and early 20s, and it progresses in severity until the 30s and 40s. With keratoconus, the earlier the onset, the more severe the disease. In terms of gender, it's relatively equal, but generally more males than females, and I have seen um, definitely more male patients than female patients with keratoconus. In terms of race, there's an increased risk for African Americans and Hispanics and Latinos when compared to Asians and Caucasians. So on to the next slide, what causes keratoconus? Is it inherited? Is it acquired? So the genetics in keratoconus is not widely understood. The CLEC study has demonstrated that there is some sort of genetic association. Other studies report more and some less association than the CLEC, but from all these studies, it doesn't seem like the genetic link is strong, but we can still see that there is one. As awareness increases and technology advances, it will become easier to diagnose keratoconus, and these numbers will likely increase as time goes on. The CLEC has shown also that eye rubbing and al allergies have strong associations with keratoconus, while other studies have shown that eye rubbing specifically triggers the onset and progression of the condition. Eye rubbing has also been found to increase inflammatory mediators, which may exacerbate keratoconus. Also, the prevalence of allergic diseases, such as allergic conjunctivitis and vernal keratoconjunctivitis, were found to be higher in keratoconus patients compared with the normal population. And of course, allergies lead to more eye rubbing. All in all, keratoconus is a multifactorial condition. It's a complex interaction of genetic and environmental factors. So moving on to symptoms, those with keratoconus typically experience mostly visual symptoms. So they may experience blur, double images, shadow ghosting of images, glare at both distance and near. So their spectacle refraction may not bring them to 2020. So they may be quite frustrated with their previous optometrists who have tried to help them with glasses. Some may come in complaining about the need to frequently update their lenses due to large changes from visit to visit. They may come in with a large bag of glasses that don't work for them. So if you have any patients like these, you may want to screen them a little bit more closely for keratoconus. After listening to your patient's chief complaint, make sure to clarify in your history about whether their blurry vision was sudden versus gradual, intermittent versus constant, how long and when did they start to experience 
these symptoms for. And don't forget to update their allergies, medical history, family history, due to the previous genetic environmental links that Dr. Lamb mentioned. So right off the bat, when you start your exam, there are several hints that might suggest that a keratoconus patient is sitting in your exam chair. And this starts with entering VAs. A lot of times the VAs can be asymmetrical between the two eyes. And sometimes if the patient has already has moderate to severe keratoconus, there's a chance they won't be able to pinhole down to 2020, assuming they don't have any other underlying condition. And with retinoscopy, or with any light when you're looking at your patient's eyes, you can take a look at the red reflex here. And in the photo that's shown to the right, you can see that the patient's right eye has a normal red reflex. But when you look at the, patient, the eye on the left, you can see this droplet-like appearance, which corresponds to the patient's cone-shaped protrusion of the cornea. Here's a short video of a retinoscopy of a scissoring reflex. You can see that um, as you ret, there's one reflex oriented parallel to the moving vertical light of your retinoscope, retinoscope. And then there's also another horizontally oriented light that's moving perpendicular to the retinoscopy light. And this is what we call a scissoring reflex, which is very classic of keratoconus. During manifest refraction, you might find that your end results are slightly inconclusive. They could have irregular astigmatism or high amounts in progressive astigmatism compared to previous years or compared to the glasses that they brought in for you to do lensometry on. Therefore, you have to consider rechecking manifest over several visits to confirm your results before prescribing for your patient. Make sure to make large jumps when providing choices so that you can provide that within their just noticeable, noticeable difference and ensure you're providing large enough targets so that they can compare it accurately. Keep in mind as well that there could be a symmetry between the refractive powers of the two eyes and that can become an obstacle when you're prescribing because imagine having minus 13 in one eye and minus two in the other eye. It just won't be as comfortable for them to wear throughout the day. And then now we'll go over the slit lamp, as well as any early and late signs that you may see in your keratoconus patients. Okay, so let's take a look at a few signs you may see on slit lamp. You may see some or all these signs in your patient, but in some cases you might not see any of these. So look at the, uh, so let's start with apical thinning. This means that there's thinning of the cornea at the apex of the cone. So looking at the image on the left, going from top to bottom, you can see a nice even thickness in the cornea. Whereas if you look at the image on the right, if you start from top going to bottom, you can see that there's an area in the middle where there's thinning when you compare to the areas superior and inferior to that. So that's thinning of the cornea at the apex of the cone. Okay, another sign is Vogue striae. So Vogue striae are these vertical streaks in the posterior stroma or decimase membrane. So you can see these vertical streaks in this image on the left here pretty obviously, but they're not always this easy to see. So you may need to look a little closer to be able to find them. Fleischer's ring, not to be confused with Kaiser Fleischer's ring, which, which is a copper deposit ring next to the limbus in Wilson's disease, Fleischer's ring in keratoconus is an iron deposit ring at the base of the cone. So looking at the image on the right in white light, you can see a white arrow pointing to a brown line. It's a little bit faint here, but if you look closely, you can see it. And in the image on the left in blue light, you can see that the white arrow pointing, um, that's pointing to a black line, and those, that is also Fleischer's ring. Sometimes I find it easier to see it in white light, and sometimes I find it easier uh, to see it with cobalt blue. So you can check with both filters. Corneal scarring. It's another common sign in keratoconus, but we want to try to um, avoid this from happening. So 
it's really important to try to diagnose your patient earlier in order to try to get them treatment sooner before it results in scarring like this image on the left, as it may affect vision even through your specialty lenses. But even with central scarring, you may be able to correct them to a functional, uh, to what, uh, to vision that's functional for them, um, or even 2020. I've had a lot, of, a few cases where I've been super surprised what I can do with a specialty lens, um, even if they have pretty dense looking scarring. So before you refer them to a transplant, try fitting them with a specialty lens as it may surprise you uh, what, what their vision can be with it. And Munson sign. So hopefully you aren't using this to diagnose your patient because this is pretty late on in the, in the condition. It is a V-shaped lower eyelid distortion in down gaze that's caused by corneal ectasia. So you can see in this image, the protrusion of the cone is so much so that it's bringing this lower eyelid down as the patient looks down. So corneal hydrops is a potential complication of keratoconus, which is typically caused by rubbing eyes. It is a sudden development of corneal edema due to a rupture in decimase membrane. You can see in, on the image on the left-hand side, that's an anterior segment OCT, and that white arrow is pointing to a break in decimase that's allowing fluid to rush into the cornea. So you can see that the cornea centrally is much thicker than the area to the left of that, which has a more normal corneal thickness. The middle picture is what a typical hydrops episode looks like. So you can see that they present quite obviously. So you, you can usually just look at them and see what's going on. Along with, uh, they'll come in with symptoms such as a sudden decrease in acuity, pain, red eye, photophobia, profuse tearing. So um, it's pretty obvious, it's hard to miss high drops. And treatment in these cases is essentially waiting for this corneal edema to subside. You can help by prescribing sodium chloride, but even with this treatment, it usually takes a while for full resolution. And it may result in scarring, like the image all the way on the right-hand side. That's a patient of mine with scarring from high drops. So it's important to tell your patients not to rub their eyes in order to avoid not only the progression of keratoconus, but also high drops. So let's talk about topography. So as I said before, you might not see any of these signs on slit lamp, especially early on the, in the disease. So you may ask, where else can I see signs if I can't see them on slit lamp? The answer to that is your topography. So your topography characterizes the shape and curvature of the anterior surface of the cornea. The general shape, uh, so your patient with keratoconus can present with different types of cones, with the most common being oval in the CLEC study. In my mind, when it comes to contact lens fitting, the more important thing is to look at the steep K value rather than trying to figure out exactly what type of cone the patient has. If they have steep Ks of 40s, I typically consider them mild, 50s is moderate, 60s to 70s is severe, but there really isn't a standard for classifying keratoconus. This is just a way I like to think about them to help me when I'm picking out an, an initial lens. So on to the next slide, we have some topography images here. I have here two of my patients. Um, the scale on the left-hand side of each image has been adjusted for each patient. Red, uh, which correlates with the bigger numbers, means that it's steeper, and blue, which correlates with the smaller numbers, means flatter. So when I look at a topography, I like to look at these numbers and see what the Ks are. I also like to look at where the red is in the picture to see to help me see where the steepest portion is located. So these pieces of information help me when I'm fitting a lens. So with patient number one, the two images on the left-hand side, you can see that the steep K is steeper in the left eye than the right eye, showing how keratoconus is a bilateral but asymmetric condition. You can also see that the cone is nipple-shaped, so if, you're, if you were to type it, um, I would type this as a nipple. 
uh, cone, uh, but it's positioned slightly inferior, but still pretty central. With patient number two, the two images on the right-hand side, you can see how it has a more oval shape. Again, I would focus in on the areas of red to see that it's located more inferiorly. And looking at the steep K values, you can see that this patient has a little bit of a milder condition than our, patient, our first patient. Topography that Dr. Lam was mentioning is a great way because it shows you a generalized shape of the corneal anterior surface. Um, there's also tomography that provides detailed info on the front surface as well as the back surface of the cornea. So if we look at these images to the left here, these are what we call elevation maps. And it's a way to see how high the mountain and how low the valleys are across the corneal surface. And the reason why I like to look at tomography is that in the early stages of keratoconus, it's a possible that we would see more signs in the back surface of the cornea than the anterior surface of the cornea, usually because the patients are frequently eye rubbing and that wears down that front surface of the eye. So in this specific case, you can see that the two left maps are an elevation map of the front surface and it shows this nice even green diffuse color showing that there's no areas that are high or low versus the two right elevation maps of the back surface of the cornea and you can see that and i'm going to try to use my pointer here um, right here is a red and yellow region indicating that there's elevation or steepening and that corresponds where with where we see a lot of steepening with keratoconus. Of course, when screening for corneal thinning disorders, we also want to measure the corneal thickness, and that is with pachymetry. The thinning over the apex of a cone with keratoconus is very highly specific and sensitive for this condition. And with pachymetry, we're looking for numbers that are approximately approximately 530 microns or less. And they also show this irregular distribution of corneal thickness across the eye. So if we look at these anterior seg OCT images to the left here, this is actually a normal cornea. And you can see all throughout this area, the thickness looks pretty even. Versus this keratoconic eye that's in this bottom left picture, you can see as I go towards the center area of the cornea here, it's much more thinner than in the periphery. These two images to the right are pachymetry maps, and the top one corresponds to a normal cornea, whereas the bottom pachymetry map is a keratoconus eye. Again, you can see that nice, even, diffuse green color in this top pachymetry map here, and the central cornea has a thickness of 555 microns, which is above an about an average corneal thickness for a normal patient. And then we compare this to the bottom pachymetry map here, and you can see that dark blue, almost black color in the central region of the cornea, and it has all numbers down to 300 microns of corneal thickness. And this is actually a patient of mine that I'm carefully monitoring so we can ensure that she's not going to have any keratoconus-related complications. After you notice corneal thinning or an irregular surface on your patient, you need to also keep in mind several differentials. Pellucid marginal degeneration is a, also known as PMD, is the second most common corneal thinning diagnosis after keratoconus, and it's often misdiagnosed. It presents in the second to fifth decade of life, and there is a band of peripheral cornea, corneal thinning from about four to eight o'clock. And as you can see here, this is a topography of a pellucid marginal degeneration patient. And it shows this kissing dove appearance is what we like to call it, um, because there's one dove and two doves kind of looks like they're coming together at their beaks. And there's corneal thinning in the inferior periphery of the cornea. The second differential is keratoglobus, 
This is characterized by a diffuse protrusion and thinning of the cornea. It's more rare, usually congenital and non-inflammatory as well. And the third condition is the post-refractive surgery ectasia. Ectasia is a common term to describe the loss of corneal integrity resulting in corneal warpage. And this usually follows some type of refractive surgery, such as LASIK, radial keratotomy, or astigmatic keratotomy. All these three differentials that I just mentioned here, they do seem similar, and they're actually treated similarly to keratoconus as well. But it's important to distinguish between all these conditions because it drives your treatment plan as well as how often you may follow up your patients because keratoconus is a progressive disease unlike these other three differentials. So let's move on to treatment and management. So in terms of, so the rigid gas permeable lenses have provided the best quality of vision for those with keratoconus. So there are three types of gas permeable lenses I'll talk about. So that's the corneal gas permeable lens, hybrid lenses, and scleral lenses. So the image on the right is a patient of mine that I fit into a corneal GP, and she's doing really well in, in corneal GPs. It is a smaller lens that sits on the cornea. You can also use hybrid lenses, which is basically a corneal gas permeable lens with a soft skirt. So it's a hybrid between a corneal gas permeable and soft lens. Lastly, we have scleral lenses, which are our larger diameter lenses that vault over the entire cornea. Soft lenses are also out there, including the typical soft torque lenses and specialty soft lenses, but they don't provide as quality of vision as rigid gas permeable lenses. And with spectacles, even though they may be difficult to prescribe, you should still try to give them a backup pair. You never know when they're gonna have that eye infection or they're gonna get sick or they're gonna have that you know, emergency, it might be an earthquake or a fire, um, and they just need to get out quickly. It's important that they have a glasses so that they can use it in those instances. And so the next slide, so, um, corneal crosslinking is another is a treatment option for keratoconus. So there's a lot to be said about corneal crosslinking. It can be a whole lecture in itself. So I'll just give you a brief overview of what it is. It's a procedure using a combination of UV light and riboflavin drops to help strengthen the collagen bonds within the cornea. So the goal of corneal crosslinking is to stabilize the disease. This is why it is especially important to diagnose your patients at an early age so you can slow or halt the progression of keratoconus, prevent scarring, and maintain their vision through contacts. Another treatment option are intacts, and these are clear PMMA arch-shaped rings inserted into the corneal stroma. Originally, this was actually used for myopia control, but due to its ability to also flatten the cornea by an average of two to three diopters, it became a viable option for mild to moderate cones, allowing them to have slight improvement in vision. And in some cases, they no longer had to wear contact lenses. Uh, several considerations for intacts is that because it's inter inserted in the mid periphery of the cornea, if the patient already has central corneal scarring, it's not treating that irregularity. So it's not really recommended for intacts. And you also are in need of at least 450 microns of corneal thickness where the rings would be inserted due to risk of corneal perforation. You may also refer your patient for a corneal transplant. They could get a full thickness transplant, also known as a penetrating keratoplasty. They can also get a partial thickness, which is called deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. And this has been a more growing alternative to the full thickness one because you actually leave your corneal endothelium intact, and this results in less graft projections and less post-operative complications. Keep in mind, though, that corneal transplants is usually a last resort treatment plan when you can no longer produce satisfactory vision with contact lenses 
or their corneal thinning is highly progressed. Following surgery, depending on how consistent their vision is and if their quality of vision with glasses is good or inadequate, some may need to come back to you for a contact lens fitting to have adequate vision following the procedure. Once you have gone over your treatment options with your patient and chosen whichever way you wanna go, it's still important to remember to monitor progression in these patients. And this can really vary depending on where your patients are. So if you have a 13 year old and it's the first time seeing this patient, they're a new patient in your office, you might even consider seeing them in one week because their refraction was a little unusual and you wanna do a refraction check or sometimes in three months because you wanna take another topography and make sure there's no progression. Versus a 40 year old um, who's showing no progression for the past three to four years in their glasses and contacts that stay the same, those patients you could probably see from six to 12 months for their follow-up. I do have patients that are in their high risk age periods and these patients are naming this one patient who has always been a little bit hesitant about cross-linking. So I actually see him back every three months because he wants me to check his vision. He wants me to take another topography to see if he really should go in for a cross-linking consultation. And that's usually because he has some concerns about the cost as well as risk of the surgical procedure. For this patient, I like to keep track of corneal staining for all my core keratoconus patients, as well as scarring. And I take careful measurements, and I also like to supplement my chart notes with photos or videos. And as always, for each follow-up, make sure to take topographies, pachymetries, those photos, so that you can compare it to the baseline. Last but not least, it's important to affirm our patients that keratoconus is not a blinding condition, and there are multiple treatments available to rehabilitate their visual acuity. In this, at the same time, you want to remind them that the keratoconus is progressive. That way, it encourages them to keep their follow-up appointments and stay in tune with their corneal health. Since 50% of keratoconus patients are reported to rub eyes, according to CLEC, Consider a topical antihistamine drop to prevent further progression of the disease and reduce any irritation. And finally, I would encourage your patient to bring their family members for their annual eye exams due to the genetic predispositions that Dr. Lam mentioned earlier. And as doctors who are trying to treat keratoconus, our goal is to diagnose early to stop the progression intervene with procedure, procedures such as cross-linking and keep them having their functional vision. After you had a lengthy conversation with your patients in the exam room, they may need some time to process and come up with questions later up in the day or in the week. So here are some resources you can share with your patients. And this includes the National Keratoconus Foundation website, which contains easy to understand videos about keratoconus, as well as they provide uh, patient education pamphlets. I also encourage my patients to visit the Living with Keratoconus website, which includes personal stories from several individuals about their own keratoconus journey. Here are our acknowledgments. Thank you to the following supervisors for going over our presentation with us. Our references here and thank you so much for listening. Thank you doctors Cho and Lam that was really great. Um, so I just have a couple of questions for you guys. Um, first of all I mean you guys have seen uh, pretty almost exclusively keratoconus patients um, since starting residency so that was a really great review of just kind of understanding keratoconus and how to diagnose it and talk to your patients about it but are there any sort of tips, tricks, or pearls that you've kind of learned in the last several months about how to, you know, anything from talking to your patients to encouraging compliance, any any pointers you have for sort of working with this population of patients? So for me, I think that one important thing I feel like helped me a lot was just being empathetic 
a lot of patients don't really have anyone else around them who understand what they're going through, and it can be really frustrating for them. We, meaning Dr. Cho and I, may not have keratoconus, but we do do see it every day. So we do see their frustrations and not being able to see clearly like everyone else through glasses or so or soft lenses. So it's really important for us to just give them the best vision we can give them and try to understand their frustrations because no one else may listen. I've noticed that so many of my patients are so incredibly grateful that I acknowledge what they're going through, even though I might not be able to solve every single issue. Yeah, I, I agree with that, with what Dr. Lam said. And um, some of these patients never knew that they had contact lenses as a treatment option in the first place. So you are providing uh, a whole lot of help to these patients and they do appreciate the work that you do for them. So that's been really nice. Um, another thing I just want to add is that I know we talked about all the difficulties when it comes to manifest refraction, um, but I'm actually surprised by the select few of my keratoconus patients who are perfectly functional in spectacle lenses. I think most of them are definitely better off with hard lenses, but um, I remember having this 38-year-old patient who's worn contact lenses her entire life, and she consistently complained about having to put on her lenses, take them off, and have to clean them every night. Um, and so I was just doing my due diligence and doing manifest refraction and actually found her best, best corrective vision to be 20-30 in one eye and 20-40 in the other. And in the state of California, that actually passes the driver's license requirements. So it was she was really grateful to even know that she could wear glasses in the first place. So I think that's a big clinical pearl when you have your keratoconus patient. That's that's a, a really good point because I think it's easy to assume that your refraction is going to be really difficult and it's easy to kind of almost skip over that part, right? Or not update it. Um, but that's such a good um, tip that, that, yeah, a lot of these patients, it's not going to be maybe 2020 vision, right? But they can get functional vision out of their glasses. And so it's important for us to remember that. I know our mentor, Dr. Tim Edrington, refers to them as earthquake glasses, right, here in Southern California. In case an earthquake comes along, they have something they can, in the middle of the night, they can throw something on, right? Um, and I think I really like your guys' um, point about empathy. I, I found that that's probably the most important part when we first diagnose patients or, or even on your follow-up care with, with patients with keratoconus, sort of validating their experience and you know being a listening ear and, and being able to say yeah what you're experiencing is is valid and, and that's what we see with this condition and, and that's what we would expect and here's what we're going to do about it that can be really um, comforting to patients so I think that's a really good really good point very good um, okay one more question and just because you guys are residents and I'm sure there are students who are listening to this who are considering residency um, maybe in cornea and contact lens, maybe in another specialty. Um, but I thought this would be a good opportunity for you to kind of uh, describe why you chose a cornea and contact lens residency um, and sort of what have been your favorite parts of, of residency so far. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think as a student, it was very difficult to follow up with patients on a consistent basis because you know you have rotating staff doctors and in fourth year you're changing your rotations every three months or so. So it, that becomes a big issue when you're doing specialty lens fits since sometimes you have to see these patients three to four times to assess their corneal health or dispense new lens orders. So I loved how residency provided this one year platform for continuity of care, where I can monitor my patient case, cases from start to finish. Um, and then a second thing for me is that, uh, you know, you're under the supervision of passionate mentors, especially at educational institutions or um, residencies at optometry schools, such as Marshall B. Ketchum. Um, and we're in a field with people who already love to teach and they're extremely experienced in academic and clinical fields, and they signed up to volunteer to help with these residencies. So that's definitely been a, probably my most favorite part of residency so far. Dr. Cho pretty much hit all the reasons why I was interested in pursuing a cornea and contact lens residency. And some of my favorite moments come from my patient encounters. 
So my patients are so appreciative of the vision we're able to give them through their lenses. I think it's so cool how we get to see them multiple times and really get to know them. I feel like when I finalize their lenses, I actually get sad to see them go because they become my friend throughout the process. Also having mentors that give me independence as a doctor, but also help guide me when I need them has been one of the highlights of the residency. They each have so much clinical experience and I've learned so much from each and every one of them. Here at SECO, I have a co-resident, Dr. Cho, and I just love having her around to bounce ideas off and just share in a similar journey. It's so cool to grow together as clinicians and to see how far we've come since we first started. Awesome. Um, thank you, Dr. Lam. <laughs> <laughs> Um, th those are really great impressions. Yeah, I I did a cornea contact lens residency as well, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. It totally changed the trajectory of my career. Um, and I would agree with everything you guys said about sort of all those favorite things and the things that sort of make it make it worthwhile and, and beneficial. So awesome. Well, that was really great. Thank you so much for putting this talk together. And thank you for all of you out there who are listening. Um, you can feel free to contact Doctors Cho or Lam or myself, if you have any questions. Um, and we'll see you for the next uh, lecture. <laughs>